Frustrated with several bad experiences from giants like Uber and Ola, these two guys bought 60 electric vehicles last year to run as taxis in Bangalore. Don't believe it? Stay with me here. This is Vikas and this is Kisle. And they bought 60 electric vehicles from BVD in the last one year. All of this to do what? Transport people from Bangalore airport to their homes and take on giants like Blue Smart, Uber and Ola in the tech capital of India. With just a four-member team, they're disrupting the ride-hailing industry one passenger at a time. If you check out their reviews on LinkedIn and Twitter, they are mind-blowing. But how did they do this? It's incredible. Incredibly interesting to see two founders who have no background in EV or ride hailing totally crush the incumbents in this sector. And that too in a diverse market like India where every passenger's needs is different from the other. You've got to hear it from the horse's mouth. This episode is a masterclass in building a David versus Goliath in one of the toughest sectors in the country. This is Kisle and Vikas in the house. We've got two guys who claim to be the gold standard of rides in India, something that I personally have used extensively and I'm very, very excited to have Kisle and Vikas in the house. Happy First day. podcast together <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. for chauffeur. Absolutely. All right, yeah. cool. Happy to be here. I'm going to read out like a quick excerpt because okay. I feel that sets a little bit of context for everyone or I will paste it out there. So I've taken this from your LinkedIn. I'm building the gold standard of rides because we're tired of cancellations, dirty cards, impolite drivers and still paying a bomb for it. Our goal at Chauffeur is to provide great experience that you can depend on. Our chauffeurs are friendly, don't constantly talk on the phone and are incentivized on good behavior rather than trips or revenue done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds familiar <laughs> and, I and I like every bit of it because <laughs> it hits really hard on, yeah man, that's the fucking challenge. So this is what we're discussing today. How do you guys get here? What is it that you're doing? Because uh, it's super ambitious from, from what it looks like. But before we sort of get to that, if you had an elevator pitch to talk about what your journey has been until you landed on Chauffeur, what would that look like? So I've been an engineer for software engineer in various capacities for 16 odd years. And I was checking along happily at Cult. And then Vikas comes to me with this thing, thinking about building this cab service, which will be like this and that and that. Yeah, that sounds good. So... Wow, <laughs> that's like really quick. <laughs> okay, cool, go, go for it. I'm a finance guy through and through. So most of my life has been, in fact, all my life before the before Shoffer has been in different parts of the world of investments and finance, from my education to my professional life. So I've worked at places like Goldman Sachs, D.E. Shaw, which is where I met him, uh, Towers Watson, Deutsche Bank, and then Small Case before um, Shoffer. So finance investments guy through and through. And how, what was, what was the instance where you guys met? Oh, uh, we were sort of, so I was working at D. Shaw in Hyderabad. Right. Since 2007 onward, that was like my campus job. And in, he joined the same company in about 2011. 11, I want yep. to say, yeah. And he moved in with some of my close, very close friends. So that's how we have been friends. We were classmates. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> okay, interesting. Interesting. So you guys have known each other for a fairly long time. Yeah, over yeah. a decade now. Yeah. yeah, over a decade. What Was there an instance that built the conviction on, yeah, I want to be in business also with him? Or was that always the case and you were just finding the right idea? I mean, and I don't think it was either. Okay. Uh, we have been friends throughout. We, right. And like so many friends, we've discussed things along the way. Uh, the plan never was to do something together or... Uh, even know that we would be individually doing something or starting of our own. Um, I think we come from a time when like entrepreneurship or st building a startup wasn't like the coolest thing. It wasn't about. glorified. There weren't that many startups yeah, and, uh, and the path was very well defined. Yeah, it's not like I was sitting around looking for like a lot of people say, oh, you are a good engineer. You must be, why don't you start something of your own? Were you looking for ideas when you found Shoffer? Right. Like, no, I wasn't. And I don't think either, either was he. Right. It just happened to him and by association kind of happened to me. Right. Was there an inflection point that led you guys to move out of where you were and just jump into something of your own? Not for me. I'd anyways quit small case and I was working on a fintech idea um, that had its own journey and like, you know, back and forth around it. But I ultimately had to drop it. Um, so I was looking for like the next gig that I would be doing. And that's when Shoffer happened. So there was no inflection point per se. Uh, with Shoffer, but there was an inflection point after starting Shoffer, like a month or two months into it, when it was like, oh, this is it. And uh, and you started Shoffer 
even while you are not sure that this is going to be a business we had a thesis we we had yeah. enough conviction to right. start it right uh do the groundwork and start it but right. i think uh, even after starting it like you know uh it took some time in that journey to kind of reinforce that conviction or even make that stronger right um because we got our validation pretty early on uh because we were doing a bunch of things that i would say is not traditional and plus we were like doing it pretty much on our own so it was very important for us to kind of have that feedback loop right like we we had some sort of milestones in mind that okay let's do this much and then we'll see what's happening right and that kind of happened quickly so then it it became like was oh. there an inflection point for you specifically because he says it wasn't for him yeah i mean towards late december it looked like things are working so initially i had been reluctant to join full time because i like let this ball roll a little bit right. and then we'll see how it goes but towards the end of december it looked like it really looked like the ball was rolling so i was like oh, fine i'll join this full time now and was the instinct of getting into entrepreneurship or a venture of your own always something that you wanted to get into no 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 i i have like i've been pitched many things because a lot of a lot of people look for tech co-founders yeah, for sure. or initial tech yeah. engineers yeah. founding employees and all of that but uh, no it is Uh, despite being pitched multiple times by multiple people this was not one of my things i, I feel like this is like a great duo uh, <laughs> that comes together right like uh, business and tech coming in <laughs> to run a large <laughs> business in india it's uh, it's not very easy to find something like this yeah definitely not definitely i and it kind of cuts both ways like a lot of like business folks as you say struggle to find tech people 100% and tech people will start a company because you can write the software right. but you make it a business it's a different mindset and perspective yeah. and skill set yeah. and so yeah i think we are both kind of lucky to be in that position where we knew each other personally yeah. and then and just of, things worked out and things kind of fell in place yeah. i mean he could have been in calcutta and then this wouldn't have worked yeah. right but he happened to be in bangalore and right how did you arrive at this particular sector right like uh, and i'll give you the vantage point that this is coming from uh, if someone's looking to enter or disrupt what's happening today mm -hmm. how should they even think about it uh, where does it start where does the inception of the idea come to, to where does the business model start to make sense at least on paper which offer specifically it happened because uh, one of my friends was looking to buy an suv and as i said like i was in a transition period so i was fairly jobless right and i was accompanying him on like a bunch of test drives and we happened to test drive the tata nexon ev Right. And it was a great experience in the sense switched on the car and didn't realize it had turned on. Right. It was quiet, it was smooth, it was fairly powerful as well. Right. So it was a, like a wow experience. But there was like a 3 lakh delta between the EV model and the petrol diesel variant. And you know, his he's a Marwari, my family is also from Rajasthan. The immediate question was does it make sense for him to buy? And to answer that question, we basically had to be like how many kilometers do you run? because evs is like a simple trade off there's a initial higher cost of purchase but the running costs are like 90% lower so the more you run the car the more economic sense it makes it didn't make sense for him because he was doing some 1000 kilometers a month he would have taken like about 5 5 and a half years just to break even that 3 lakh delta the finance and you just came out at <laughs> that time with an excel sheet saying yeah this doesn't make sense <laughs> i've seen I, that excel sheet <laughs> <laughs> To be fair, I would say that there was the Marwari in us, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, just asked that question: "Ki why does it make sense?" Right. Okay. Um, and we did that model, and it was like just took us five minutes. So right. you know, it didn't make sense for him. But the obvious question we asked was like, "Look, uh, I mean, commercial guys should be doing like three hundred kilometers a day. Right. If you are suddenly doing nine thousand kilometers a month, that <coughs> output becomes very different. So you're like, well, why is no one else doing it?" So that essentially was the starting point of going down this rabbit hole as to like okay why is no one else doing it because this math is so simple like <coughs> anyone it should be obvious to most people um but we didn't see much happening and this was <coughs> back in July 2022 yeah so then we went you know kind of like I started doing that research saw that okay blue smart exists saw that uh, a few other pay local operators have mushroomed up um did a lot of due diligence in terms of speaking to people in the industry uh as to like what the deal with EVs are like you know what are the challenges um tested out quite a few of these other folks who had started up and realized that 
they all were doing it pretty much in the same way and were facing similar challenges what are the challenges um they <coughs> basically were all using the same car and that car had like a lot which of car was this this is the tata tigor ev right um and you know they faced uh, issues when it came to firstly the range was small less uh, around like let's say 160ish 180ish and the cars needed i mean they had a lot of downtime in terms of charging they all had these challenges and were all operating it uh, approaching this business from the same lens and we just realized at that point when we were starting that there might just be better ways to do this electric vehicle in commercial operation is a much better use case no one in india is doing that effectively because they're all using a vehicle that is not the most efficient on road largely because of the charging downtime that it has and the range and the range right so mm-hmm. operational efficiency of yeah yeah the existing vehicle that say someone like a blue smart was using was giving you an indication that this is a space that could be disrupted mm mm-hmm. See, I think it's the it's slightly different. Like okay. the fact that Blue Smart was doing it with that many cars then was a clear pointer that people have thought about this and this can work. That the that the TAM exists. That the, that the TAM exists and EVs work in a certain way. Right. We just figured that because all these guys are doing it a certain way, we believe that there is slightly better way of doing this. I believe the starting mm-hmm. point of getting into something like this was the fact that EVs yeah, need I to mean, be in yeah, commercial yeah, we, operation. Yeah, we we. We didn't drill down from oh we are facing problems in mobility and therefore let's try. No, to no, I'm with you. I, I, I understand. Yeah, it, mm. it made a lot of financial sense. Mm. So in Correct. finance, it's called alpha. Like there's this opportunity to earn yeah. super normal profits. Yeah. Um. So you know that is what EVs unlocked. So this was July 22. July August 2020. Right. Correct. And you arrived at the fact that there is there is business sense when both of these come together. How did it become a business model from there? Well I mean you looked at the larger space as users and living in Bangalore we knew the challenges of let's say right. uh, ride hailing services in general yeah. right people are unhappy with the current situation right so that was there it made business sense from day 1 from like a pure modeling perspective we actually spent a lot more time disproving that thesis because no yeah. one was doing it like yeah. that I would, I would assume so. Yeah. Mm. Then and the first it. thing that you ask is why is no one doing this? Yeah, right. Like exactly. if it's so visible. Exactly. Are we the only people who are thinking about it? Correct. Right. Interesting. Yeah, and so both of us not being from this industry, it's there's always this element of like maybe we are misreading this whole thing in some way, yeah. right? Because there are people experienced, but they don't seem to be doing it. So what's wrong? Right. Right. So I think that's where a lot of the time went in the early days. The model right. was easy and straightforward and very <laughs> accessible. Interestingly enough, I don't think that model <laughs> has changed. Like in fact, like uh, we were discussing this some time back, but whatever that initial model was, like we are like pretty much ninety five percent there. Like or right. like you know that's played out like that. Right. And how did you go about from there? Right. Like you arrived at the fact that this is making a sense in terms of business. I've I've tried my level best to disprove this thesis but it's still standing true. What got you from from that to day 1 of chauffeur? And what was what were the steps largely involved, right? Like there is there's a large part of buying the cars, there's a large part of evaluating which cars do I buy, there's a large part of where do I start, how do I improve the experience and I and I and I don't want you to drill down in each of them but just like high level pointers of what that looked like. I think it's important to build a thesis. Yeah. So while we had like you know um, a model uh, in terms of what this would look like or what the finance side of these things are, the thesis had to be built. And the moment, let's say that happens, conviction increases as you build on your thesis. So it basically, it involved a lot of talking to people, doing research, understanding what the challenges are. Coming who, who to are the sense, kind of people you spoke to? Folks in the industry, folks who had been like you know in companies running uh, uh, EV fleets. um in different sides of the business um even drivers like a lot of drivers i spoke to a bunch of drivers um, in existing ride hailing services in existing ride hailing services Amazing. went to gurgaon to try out like let's say um, you know blue smart yeah um and over like two months that's what helped me build conviction that you know there seems to be not a good reason to be not doing it once we didn't have like good answers as to why no one else is doing it, it just makes sense that look there's no other way to see whether this makes sense or not apart yeah. from just doing it yourself right you have to do a small experiment and then see what happens right <laughs> right so the thinking was essentially look how do we go about starting it and how much capital can we kind of budget and allocate and yeah. plan 
for let's say you know what is a decent number right. to say that okay this we can make it work or not make it work right so when we started out with two cars but we immediately we knew that we'd have four right uh, but we had kind of like <coughs> decided mentally that we will at least get to like a 20 30 car operation there are more than enough businesses that aren't startups or like cool or whatever which have like a 20 30 car operation right so the question like i had to get comfortable with the downside saying that if none of this works will i still be running like a 20 30 car shop right the moment i was comfortable with that is when like it made How sense for me to comfortable with it just to see that okay like i have this thesis would it play out or not like it was actually like putting to test that are you that smart i will you be able to do this will your thesis play out um will you be okay if you know things don't go a certain way as planned right and will you then kind of continue doing it or not so it was answering more like i would say larger picture questions as opposed to specifics on the business model or how operations would be and so on are there some sectoral indicators that make this time to be operating in this space right for disruption i would say so i mean especially when we launched it was ripe for disruption mainly because a bunch of things weren't playing out people were unhappy on in the entire cycle right like users were unhappy companies weren't doing well their shareholders were unhappy drivers were unhappy so everyone was unhappy so it made a lot of it made it easier to go in as like a new entrant and people would give you chance right right if people are happy then the cost of acquisition uh and their willingness to try out something new becomes less because you're already happy right if you're unhappy on the other hand and looking for alternatives then it makes it much easier for like a new entrant to come in and right. they have a better chance right interesting i mean there's a technology disruption here like evs changed the game fundamentally of doing this business as compared to petrol diesel cars so that is like a very classic how you read about innovators dilemma and all that kind of disruption yeah. right that's pretty much that and then on top of that you have widespread dissatisfaction like vikas was talking about it's a very good combination like if you can use this technical advancement to attack this problem and they may not may or may not be directly correlated right like customers being unhappy has nothing to do with ev or not ev but if you can use this technology to kind of solve it in whatever way then then that's the perfect recipe right there are two sectors that you primarily fall in right one is ride hailing the other is electric vehicles is there a challenge that you face that you are in electric vehicle today not that much today. infrastructure infrastructure is all right actually it's improved a lot significantly since we started operations as well and right. it's in that direction like that trajectory is only going to get better so right. uh, i mean in terms of tailwinds like you said right government policy public yeah. willingness interest investment yeah. environment everything is in favor kind of right? right what problems would be faced if we like from an ev perspective yeah depends on where you're doing it bangalore metro is not a problem if you want to do something in some remote village sure there is a problem today right right, right. so it depends on where you're but doing it but that's not it. what we're thinking today yeah, yeah right yeah. Like, so, okay see there are a few uncertainties when it comes to evs which will only be answered over time all right and what will they be like like for example there's no secondary marketplace for evs today so it's difficult to gauge what the secondary like you know what the second hand value of a ev car looks like 5 years down the line and it doesn't follow the same depreciation amortization route there is a question like you we there's an uncertainty around that it may or may not is this based on the policy framework on electric vehicle depreciation or is this something that just hasn't been experimented with it just needs more time because there's just not enough data right um you know there there aren't like that many people selling their EVs existing EVs it's are fairly they, new yeah, yeah it's fairly new right and unfortunately when it comes to these things you either need a secondary marketplace or you need a long enough track record to understand what that will play out like who would you say is your direct competitor today blue smart yeah of course would you also count uh, any secondary competitors um so there are quite a few players that have emerged in the last 3 4 years you don't identify uber or ola as a competition of course they are okay. like in the but like from a pure ride hailing perspective right because right. like it's uh, ultimately a uh, user wants to be hiring a cab correct right it right. it could come from a blue smart it could come from an uber or the behavioral dynamics are the same <laughs> 
Correct. So from a user perspective, every like, you know, or like a industry perspective, we are competing against all of them because right. we are yeah. providing I a mean, cab as well. Your bhaiya who comes reliably every time Correct. is a competitor in a yes, certain way. Right? Yes, yes. Even mm-hmm. even drive you is a competitor in some way. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, all of them. Yeah. So in that strict sense, yes, everybody is a competitor. Was it not challenging to imagine competing with a bunch of very established players? How do you how do you come past that hurdle in your mind? One of the things was like, for example, let's say the likes of Uber and Ola, right? Like they have a specific business model, uh, which directly doesn't allow them to quickly adopt EVs because drivers, they require drivers to be purchasing assets or cars, right? Um, which from our research kind of told us is not happening imminently. Um, but beyond that also, look, I mean, my core belief is that good service always has like a place, right? Like if they're like Uber, Ola, of course is there, but there's a large and long tail of unorganized players like the Bayazi he mentioned, right? Uh, everyone has like a guy that they rely, uh, that is reliable and they, you know, they use, they prefer using because the alternatives have some drawbacks or a lot of drawbacks. So we did think of it, of course, but um, came back to if we are doing our job well, um, we would, we would, we had the belief that adoption would increase. Right. Because again, like if you spoke to people like two years back and like challenges of Uber and Ola, it was even more painful back then than right. what it is now. Is there a global or an Indian company, uh, and it may not be in the same sector, that you all at some, in some place or the other keep benchmarking to? So I personally have like two, uh, from like a services perspective, Taj is like, you know, something that I really look up to and like, it's very delightful. Um, so we would like, would want to emulate the feeling that people have after experiencing Taj. There is something about Taj that just draws you back and makes you feel at home. It's their service, right? It's it, of course, like they all can have great properties, but the service and yeah. the, the attention they give to their guests and they call them guests, not customers, as do we. It matters. Like What that, is the difference? I mean, a guest is can be a customer, but like you, you f- approach that differently. Right, whereas a customer is very transactional, a guest is an experience. Mm. <laughs> For like, like a good three months, we had to like distill, like you know, hammer this down that we are calling them guests, like drivers. Yeah, small things team. that matter. Everyone had to refer to the user as the guest because now they everyone are like it's very implied guest because guest has that kind of a connotation that it's not just transactional. You got to take care of them. So Taj, mm. Taj well. is one. Personally, I'm a very big fan of Zitoda as a company. So in just how they have built it, not only from like a pure business perspective, because they bootstrapped and like are profitable, but they're also like very nice folks. I love how folks who are there enjoy being there. So they obviously must be doing a bunch of things right. From my uh, tech lens, I've got Netflix. Yes, for yeah, sure. So I have in my career learned a lot of the way mm. of doing the right things, the right time, right way. And it helps that they have reinvented themselves over and over and over again, over you know, kept themselves super relevant yeah their long life so that says something to you know their resilience as a right. business right and their tech stuff has been fantastic so what did day one look like when when you had two cards that you started with what yeah. what did that day look like like what was happening there both mentally and and practically did right. the first car break down or the third car break the first car actually <laughs> broke down the first car broke down <laughs> yes. all right okay it tell was, us more. so the first <laughs> the first day was pretty intense because we got the car the cars were delivered in the evening i took one of the cars my office manager took the other one uh, to the hub or whatever and the car i was supposed to do the first ride with you know a guest uh, and I parked the car and while I was parking the car, it just switched off. Um, and then it wouldn't switch on. Oh my God. And it was just like, <laughs> like the fuck has happened? Like, you know, we just took this bed, this is an expensive car. And now it's not switching on. <laughs> like, you know, right. so the whole that evening, that plan went off uh, horribly. <laughs> And we still did the booking, like my office, uh, the other guy went out and like, you know, did the booking. It was the first night itself, then we got the cars. The OEM was very helpful in terms of resolving the issue. It <coughs> happened to be like one of low probability events, right. which happened on the first day, which made it even more. <laughs> but it sort of prepped you up for like what's coming. <laughs> 
sure i can look that in hindsight and <laughs> frame yeah, it like yeah, that but that yeah, evening but, i was yeah but that that evening it's a, it's a panic moment right yeah, got a sure. just was, bought an expensive car <laughs> started a business left everything and, and someone's <laughs> waiting to be dropped to the airport yeah 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 i mean we had that time we kind of yeah. like could manage that but it was more like look we took this bet and like this is happening on like the first day what the hell right new car <laughs> brand new car brand new car brand new car right how Over many cars are you on today we today has 60 cars wow we just added 10 yesterday or day before and you guys have bought all of these cars mostly we have a few on lease we have couple on profit sharing arrangements but by and large almost all of them are bought you know, how much how much do you price say center of the city in bangalore till mm-hmm. the airport what is the average price that looks like undiscounted price is like um 1560 from let's say a uh, infantry road yeah. to an airport right, right. Uh, we've been running it at 1310 for some time now right what are some other companies at they fluctuate right right like um and so you've been fixed we've been fixed yeah, yeah. since we launched we've not that, that, that was that a core price. prop that we will not do surge pricing variable pricing this that interesting so what are some other incumbents at they'd be it's a range i would say from like let's say 850 900 to like 1600 1700 right um on like really high demand days or like you know let's say long weekends it can even be like 1800 and this right. is by the way not even the comparable segment that i'm quoting this is like for the smaller cars not the high end versions so yeah that's like, also yeah. because you only have that as an option so your customer or your guest can actually end up choosing uh, a lower segment vehicle in in with competition or say with any right. other competitor but uh, chooses you for several other reasons that we'll now get to but you're priced say an a- on an average day most times say 15% higher and you justify that and mm. and that's great we are priced higher i think we would it's fair to say that we are like 20% higher or sometimes like 20% lower depending correct. on the time of the day correct because there's dem- uh, like you know uh, surge pricing mm. surge pricing yeah. and of demand hours as well but how do you, how do you that. how do you arrive at that price point that you guys have well i mean in two different ways one we looked at it is what is it the math that works for us right so firstly it's a question of what makes sense for us from like a pricing business perspective and then the third uh, second thing is like you know how much can you charge and then want to charge right so like we could have priced this anywhere between let's say what i say now is 13 10 discounted to like even 2 grand and like you know a bunch of people would still be using it just because that delta in experience is that high yeah um but the math worked for us at like a certain price point and we decided why not then kind of focus on uh, having that kind of a price point and then kind of reaching out to a bit more people um because getting more customers in first with with the price point correct Right. Well, I mean it's not even like it has to make business sense firstly. Yeah. Right? Like if if it didn't make business sense or let's say only like a 1600 made a business sense. Right. We would be just pricing it like that. Correct. So um, do you currently burn on every ride or are you No, no. No, no. You sell through on every ride. I mean on every ride is probably not the right way to look at it. Right. Uh but so how do you look at it? On like a daily basis. Interesting. Right. So how you do well as a business is basically a function of how many trips you do and what fare you charge which will determine your revenue per day correct so ultimately that's really what matters right even if you do just four rides a day and let's say your utilization is just on the lower side right does it really matter if you're like more than profitable it doesn't the goal is always to like hit a certain amount of revenue uh, so that you more than break even on that particular day we've been operationally profitable since december 2022 which was the first full month of yeah. launch and how many cars was that back in december 22 four. Four, four cars and now we have 60 cars yeah. is there how do you decide that we need to add more cars because there's mm-hmm. always yeah uh, a catch 22 or like a chicken and egg story right yes. like will the demand catch up yeah uh, and stay afloat i think we like to play within a range of how many trips we are doing per car yeah so the moment it starts hitting like an upper threshold is when it starts making sense for us to kind of like add more cars and then come bring that number down and then strive as a business to push that number back up again and so, so. today you guys are at 60 what, how does that plan say for the next one year three or whatever if you have is it more services is it more destinations within the city what is scale for you at least in the short term 
I mean, scale is number of cars for sure, but like, you know, simultaneously, it's also seeing how the business side plays out, right? There's no point having like, let's say 500 cars if you're not doing a good job at 100 cars. We are very mindful as to like, you know, with the cars that we do have, are we doing a good job with that or not? Which by, by saying good job, what I mean is like, are we, min are we maintaining the revenue per car that we expect? Are we having the operational margins that we expect? Right. Uh, if those aren't happening, that doesn't make sense to kind of just add in 100 cars, as well as like the quality of service. Yeah. You don't want to add more cars if you're facing some issues that you are not able to solve at that particular stage. Right. Might as well spend time focusing on solving that. And then you can add more cars. Adding cars is relatively easy. Like if you have money, getting the right drivers, getting the right team, maintaining the experience, those are things that take time. And so we deliberately kind of don't go crazy, like add like 100 cars. Where are you getting 250 drivers from? Good drivers from. Right. What is it that you keep in check today that got you from four to 60 cars from a from an experience standpoint? Would you first agree that Taj is like at a decent scale? Yeah, 100%. Do you think their quality has degraded because they are at a decent scale? No, no, no. I don't disagree on so the fact that I, it'll mm. like I don't believe so, that it'll decelerate. Correct. So like the general belief is that, okay, if scale happens automatically, like experience mm. then suffers. I would like to counter that saying like how you scale matters, yeah. which in turn will determine how you know, you've been able to maintain that experience or elevate that experience also as a serv as a service provider. I think if everybody, like, of course, we have SOPs, right? Yeah. Like, which we keep drilling into our drivers, into our other, you know, team members and all of that. Right. We repeat that every month, every week, as often as it is, it is required, right? right? Um, and it helps that if, if the entire company's incentives are aligned, right. you know, ki if you do these things yeah. right, this is how you make money, this is how you get successful. It helps a lot. Can you, can you go deeper on that incentive? What is the incentive structure there? And how do you incentivize the driver to do this? Because so incentives for drivers, they have a incentive and that is driven entirely based on customer feedback. Right. All right. So if customer doesn't say bad things about them or says good things about them, they right. get that money. And if the customer says bad things, they do not get that money. So it's very, very linearly it's aligned. It's binary. In I mean, it's not really, binary, it's not binary, but there is a significant impact. Right. Uh, on every time, you know, a customer complains about a driver. Right. So that is by itself a huge thing. And by repeating our SOPs and the brand that we offer that we want to portray to our guests, right? Over what, 15 months now, more or less. Yeah. Now there is a core of drivers who have imbibed these values and the way that we operate, the things that we appreciate or not appreciate. And that kind of percolates now as a culture thing among the driver community as well. Interesting. Yeah, I'm a firm believer and proponent, like, you know, in that incentives are the superpowers right. that drive any organization and human behavior. Um, so your incentives... Is there, is there a sticks model also to this? Like, I understand the carrots that there are. Is there a sticks model yeah, also? Of course. Like, right. we get three negative feedbacks in like a month and, you know, you're like an equivalent of a pip. Mm. Uh, for drivers, right? right? Or you put the, you're put on bench and so on. And we then have a chat. Like the stick is more like having a chat and understanding what went wrong. And a lot of times people aren't fit for, let's say, a chauffeur. They right. come from like a very different mentality. And while you can change or improve driving skills, you can't change character or like behavior that easily. True. So we are a lot more mindful in our hiring of like the behavior and the personality of that person as opposed to their you know, they could be like extremely experienced driver, but if they are not cut out in a certain way that's required for, let's say, a five star experience, it, this is not the place for them. Did you have a challenge when you went out to get drivers on board? Because such a thing didn't exist anywhere for them to be comfortable with these sort of SOPs or incentive structures? Some of it is a challenge, but it's, uh, let me just point out that services like this do exist. Right. It's just that they are not like, you know, uh, competing with the likes of ride hailing services. True. Right. But there are premium services even today. They just charge a bomb for it. Yeah. Uh, and drivers do work there and they're very happy working there. Like, it's not like we are reinventing the whole thing altogether. Very nice. It is a challenge to kind of find drivers and like, you know, uh, weed out uh, the good ones from the bad, um, the polite ones from the ones who have attitudinal issues. But it's not that big a challenge also, I would say. Honestly, I think we kind of got very lucky with our initial five, seven, ten drivers. Very, very good folks. Right. And so that helped. That that was and a now huge the, help. And now the driver community has in some way a subculture that procreates. 
It does. I mean, we our word of mouth game with drivers is extremely strong yeah. as well. It's not just with guests of chauffeur. It's also yeah. on the driver side, and that's honestly because we take care of them. Like we genuinely want them to be happy and try our best to resolve all kinds of issues they have, which I think is allows us to set ourselves apart not only on the user side of the experience but also on the driver hiring side, sourcing side. and everything because drivers are the most integral part of this business how did you buy these vehicles out or why did you decide to buy versus lease so leasing in 2022 essentially wasn't as prevalent an option leasing in car as a concept might be prevalent but to do at for a certain price point for car it's not that pre- it wasn't that prevalent it still isn't that much leasing is less optimized in india if i may say so what do you mean by that leasing is a lot more capital efficient in let's say foreign markets than it is in india uh, as a general rule and this that has to do with the size of the markets as well this is from a taxation standpoint both taxation as well as like from uh, the industry perspective from the leasing But companies you're from saying from a leasing okay, company's understood. perspective Got it. and hence yeah. from me as Yeah. Someone taking a lease is perspective is efficient as well. As well yeah, because Got ultimately it. it's a financial decision. It is difficult. It was difficult to get the first cars because it's a it's again a chicken egg problem, right? To get a loan or even a lease for that matter, you would want to show finance. You would have to show financials, but you won't have financials if you don't have cars, <laughs> right? So it it takes a it took a lot of work to convince people to give us the first set of two and four cars. uh because it's a new company no track record no uh forms to like gst forms to show and stuff like that it took us us putting our asses on the line uh to say that okay you know if something happens we will cover for it how how bullish are you on uh on the india story <laughs> <laughs> with the direct with the debt exposure i'm sure you can <laughs> i mean I, I actually don't know how to answer that. It's it's not that I think this is the India has the right market, the right people to appreciate and buy the kind of thing that we are building. Right. And I think that will continue to grow. Right. So yeah, I think bullish. Yeah. I mean, sure. way before Shawfer started, right? Like a yeah. finance guy, investments guy. This is something that we've been like have been familiar with for a while now. Right. I was. F- very bullish in like the fintech scene uh, in 2016 2017 i moved from london here to back to india just yeah. because like you know there is a lot more things happening here and it's a huge market so irrespective of whether we are doing chauffeur or not that has always been known that this is a very big market a very large one and a diverse one it's no longer like india is just this kind of a market or not willing to spend or there's no place for um great services in india like a bunch of things have been built here for a while uh, and a lot of cool products and services have come out of india in the last few years what's the one thing that you think most startup founders believe in that you don't mau hmm okay tell me more if you have enough people somehow using your product money will get made So you're saying everyone believes in MAU, whereas you don't. You don't believe that's a that at least for your business that's a great metric to track. Yeah, I, it doesn't really matter like wow. who's doing what with your product. It's, right? Are you making money? Or are you not making money? Hmm. That's, that's what the business is. Hmm. Everything okay. else is a tool, and I think MAU right. is a particularly misplaced tool. Very interesting. Coming from the tech world, <laughs> very interesting. Okay, cool. So even a business that operates really well at scale or makes a lot more business sense at scale has to scale profitably. I think it's it's important to have this one golden rule. If you had the money, let's say forget funding and everything. Correct. If you had the money, would you be doing it like that? If the answer is yes, then sure. It doesn't matter whether you are raising from it's your capital or external capital, right? I think that somewhere has been hmm missing or yeah. like uh, lost uh, to a good extent. Right. Scale should not be like a bad thing. There are economies of scale. Right. Right. But if your core itself is like shaky, some things are much easier to solve when you're not at scale. So I mean, I think that scale versus profitability uh, trade-off is something we believe very differently than what others around. But the approach are to profitability is very different in your case. Y- yes, approach to profitability. scale everyone has the same end goals yeah right like we want 50x we want those kinds of returns uh we just feel that there's a different way to achieve that path hmm uh is there an underrated advice that you want to give to someone else starting up 
this space any space anywhere like just underrated advice as a founder i would say that you know again like there is an idea and then there is this stage of building conviction in that idea the jump from basically idea to execution is somewhere where all this fundraising and everything starts becoming part of it right i don't know if this gets said enough but essentially my thing is are you going to approach it like that if it was your money if the answer to that is yes then i think it's worth going ahead and doing it right interesting what do you do as a founder that you absolutely hate doing but you still have to because you're the founder paperwork signing oh, si- signing papers yeah. as a person my screen time is actually on the lower side i'm not the one who's <coughs> like always on like uh chatting or like you know on the phone that much <laughs> that has not been the case at all in the last 15 months <laughs> <laughs> you constantly been on the screen screen uh, on chats answering mm. calls uh, the number of calls i have answered over the last 15 months in chats we yeah. responded to and i've seen you answering those like <laughs> when, when whenever we met like <laughs> you're you're somewhere or the other there's a call coming <laughs> Yeah, yeah so that yeah. is I can vouch for it. That is not something I have been as a person before all this. Right. Does it ground you in some way? In a lot of ways. And it's very integral like to our business, right? Like I know I didn't like it that much, but now I like it and I liked it from day one because I know it's very core to the business. Right. It's uh, the shortest feedback loop we have essentially. Like, yeah. Right yeah, goes yeah, wrong, correct. you immediately get a call. Right. Right. And your number is the one that's out there. I mean, there's a customer support number, yeah. but Yeah, we handle it. Wow, interesting. <laughs> uh, how do you personally grow as people beyond business? Like, is there something that you all do that keeps you fueled up? Fueled up or grow? They're different things. Both. Okay. Weekends is probably fueled up in some way. Activity that you do to keep yourself fueled up, and then what do you do to grow? So I think for me, in the sense of growth, like this whole doing a business has been growth, right? Like I've been a engineer all my career. Engineers, by and large, get to get exposed to technical product things. not particularly to business, business thing yeah. right yeah. so just being part of that side as well now what is the tax law on this like you know how will you launch this like only later in my career did i start doing these conversations about okay i'll build this feature but how will you launch it but now that is it's reverse a reverse for me now yeah. right like how we going to launch it and then let's see how we are going to build it in the technology piece or yeah. whatever right yeah. that's a secondary problem because yeah. one way or the other we'll build it i know that much right right so the growth piece has been that essentially being exposed to all of these concerns and problems and solutioning that i was never really a part of directly at least so that that has been a huge kind of thing for me interesting and how do you how do you get to know how do you learn something around that i have honestly learned a lot from him because i mean he comes with a bit of that and he's particularly good at it so i have learned a lot of that from him and then like one way or the other i have to be a part of all these conversations like you're talking to your ca or your lawyer yeah. or whatever it is right? and you enjoy that comes and goes <laughs> <laughs> to the extent one can yeah. <laughs> like, <come> on. <laughs> yeah 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 true yeah true. and what do you do to like do you read like listen to something go out meet up with people like what is that new growth coming from beyond the inward focus on the business i mean a lot of the go- growth is personal growth right like right. it's so tied together like i have to be very real with my flaws and my strengths so that those feedback loops help a lot i make sure like i have a bunch of them going on with him with guests with other people um just because we have a thesis and like you know i have a thesis but it's very important to kind of have like a rounded exposure so for me those feedback loops help grow in terms of like other aspects like i think health is like a good focus it's also downtime right and it's also what do you do so i'm like very i'm like i'm like a noob when it comes to like gym and all of that so for me that's that is happening now uh so that is interesting and exciting are you guys into books podcasts anything both? i read both yeah both both what what are some couple of recommendations all oh, right now i'm hooked on empire i keep <laughs> talking about empire to almost everyone cuz i love it so much yeah absolutely it's it's fantastic so empire is a podcast i'm hooked on empire and fall of civilizations books i used to read a lot it slowed down significantly hmm. but yeah i'm trying to get into it again read a little bit more interesting i'm reading a book now called maverick let's see it, yeah. it's interesting the brazilian industrialist yes, correct very uh, it's set in the 1980s but like right. really very real very interesting yeah and it feels different like you know that guy has built it very differently 
I'm forgetting his name. You know, now Semek, some uh, uh, Rick, Ricardo Semler. Ricardo yeah. Semler. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So yeah, I've read that. The reading habit is in some ways coming back now. Like it's very like over time that habit was lost, and it's very easy to kind of like be okay with it. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, because yeah. there's there's so much content now floating yeah. around. If there was one thing that a founder should come to you guys for, what should that be? Right. <laughs> <laughs> they that, should come. For that, is right. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. That is correct. Honestly, anything like if if they think we can help, they should come and approach. But Actually, I think that is one advice I will give: is to approach people and ask for help. Yeah, like we wouldn't be here if we hadn't done that. Who did you ask for help from? All kinds of people, from like random people on LinkedIn that I found to people in my network, because we were not from this space. Right, we had yeah. to build an idea about this space. reach out to all kinds of people in this space yeah. for which we had no connects ourselves yeah, that's also a good underrated advice like you believe people will not respond but they actually do they do the yeah that has been for like or nearly shocking like how helpful people are yeah like go out of their way to talk to you connect you to you know i think we people. connected like that like i just wrote yes. to him yeah. one fine day and yeah came from you as like a user or someone who'd known of this yeah. service right yeah. so and like that it also helps that we do that customer support right because yeah. it makes us a lot more accessible even to that side and right. build out more connections but my advice is going to be to go out and ask for help like if you're going to assume what that other person is going to think and do and play that out in your head which will prevent you from hmm. taking that action Love is it, yeah. is not the right approach i think you should be more willing to hear someone say no I don't have time than assuming that and not trying. Right. No, this is great. Uh thank you so much for being on this doing this on a Saturday morning. I know you've slept very late. <laughs> 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 and still up here. Uh but thank you guys. Uh it's been fun I hope. It's been Absolutely. fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, you you weren't prepared for like so much business conversation early in the morning. <laughs> No, no. You can do this at like two in the night. You also, and all of this yeah. will <laughs> yeah. happen. 